everywhere, you know, it, who are you? Who are we? Uh, you were the college kid at, at Buffalo in February 1970. Maybe you were at the Cap in Port Chester in 71. Famous, I think there was a fire drill that night. Maybe you were, uh, you were there. Maybe someone was in that gym at Barton Hall, Cornell 77. Hey. Or you went to Trinity or UMass and you were at the Hartford Coliseum or the Philadelphia Spectrum or Boston Garden or MSG. Or you got on the bus in the 1980s and some of the younger people in here, maybe you, you're, you're at, this, this is always a story I hear. Somebody's older brother visits them at boarding school and comes with a box of cassettes in the 80s. <laughs> like, you gotta listen to this, you know? And, and oh yeah. Uh, or you're in, you know, the Gen X or Millennials, and you're you're a fish fan, and you're following the tour today. Usually, this goes by. This is how it drops everybody. This is how I've learned. Basically, drops into these categories. You saw Pigpen. How many people in this room saw Pigpen? Wow. Okay. You get the Croix de Guerre. Fantastic. Right, we were there with with Pigpen. Uh, who saw Brent? Who saw Brent? Okay. And who remembers Donna Shrieky? Okay. Uh, it doesn't matter if you were a spinner or you were on the front rail. It, 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 it's a unique experience. Here are three just pearls of wisdom I learned attending the conference last year at the, uh, out in San Jose. These are my three highlights right off the top. To be part of this unique community. Number one, spirituality. Jerry once said, every time we play, it's like going to a ch to church, a pretty far out church, but a church nonetheless. And it doesn't matter if it's your church, your ashram, your synagogue, your meditation center, that's, that spiritual journey is part of it. Number two, generosity, generosity. I learned this from a great professor of sociology at the University of North Carolina, Rebecca Adams, who's one of the major scholars in the field. She was out in the parking lots in the 70s and 80s recording the kids. And you'd be surprised to learn how America's greatest road band played nonstop for 30 years and another 20 years, of course, after Jerry. One earns respect in the Grateful Dead community by demonstrating, it's not by how much money you make, it's not by how, you know, you're a big star, you're the Rolling Stones, you're the Eagles, it's not by the stardom. You earn respect in the Grateful Dead community by how much generosity and how much you learn to give. What other super American band gave, sent five, six, seven hundred tickets from backstage out to the parking lot so that the kids out of the lot would, would get to see the show and get inside? Jerry said art is free. And in a world of record agents and LA, uh, you know, Warner Brothers and guys, uh, they gave the music away for free. Those, I mean, how many of you are like driving down the 95 or in, in a jam and you're listening to 23 Sirius? It's like, thank you, thank you. This is the gift that keeps on giving. I mean, I'm just thankful. I hear things Des Moines, you know, Des Moines 85, things never heard. They gave the music away. All those kids taping those, uh, those concerts. Number three, the magic is about the music. And it's all about the music. It's incredible complexity. It's deep American rhythm and blues. It's hillbilly origins. It's bluegrass and Appalachia melodies. West Texas cowboys mixed in, of course, with John Coltrane's jazz, plugged into Owsley Stanley's infamous wall of sound, psychedelicized at the acid test at Stinson Beach of the Longshoreman's Hall, the winter and spring of 1966, and transformed into a permanent contribution to the history of American culture and American rock. And it doesn't matter who you go to hear today, any permutations of, of, of the core four, Bobby and Rat Dog, Phil and Further, even DSO, you know the joke about DSO, if you close your eyes, they almost, if you close, you, you know, if, you, if, if, you, if you listen to Further, you close your eyes, they're almost as good as DSO. Uh, the music lives on. Let me frame the context for our American Studies Conference on race protest race and protest uh, in American culture. Uh, call this from Berkeley's free speech movement to the students taking over Canisius Hall. Just a quick way that we can put this into a context. 
as scholars, as researchers, there is an enormously deep field. I mean, you, you're going to be surprised if you begin to do research in not only the 60s, but the influence of the San Francisco scene. Uh, th this type of overview of the 60s, what it was, the cultural transformation, this is something that is so important in understanding, but in, because of our theme today in our conference about protest, uh, it, it was always intertwined with music. It was always, it was folk music, it was Dylan and Joe Baez, 14 students in the free uh, speech movement, Mario Salvo, uh, out in Berkeley in 64, 65, on that, on the, that's uh, by Joan uh, singing at Berkeley in 65. The Vietnam conflict is, you know, and you have to understand everybody, when we professors, when Dr. McFadden or Dr. Alfonso, when we talk about Vietnam, this, is, this could have been the, the War of the Roses. Or the, I mean, this is something so distant to our, to 19 year olds. But those of us who are of, of a certain age remember that the deep searing of power of that, a half a million US troops, 58,000 American deaths, 1.2 million wounded, and of course a complete ecological catastrophe of Southeast Asia, defoliance, an un incredible uh, apocalypse now. Thank you, Francis Ford Coppola. The magic happens here in, you know, the, the summer of love, 67, it's really 65, 66, you know, when, you, when you speak to the veterans, it's really 65, 66, where the scene came together. Here we are at 710 Ashbury. I was there with my grandson over Thanksgiving break, and we call this the Holy House. You know, taking a picture there. This is like making a pilgrimage in Jerusalem. <laughs> and the dead were always integrally involved in this uh, supporting of this cultural revolt, this this revolt against authority. Here they are at the Greek in Berkeley. Here they are supporting the strikers at Columbia in 1968. Mark Rudd, SDS, the free concert at Columbia. They uh, they couldn't even get the equipment up uh, onto. They had to you know use all kinds of uh, innovative ways to get the equipment uh, uh, onto the steps at Columbia, and then. You know, something that will burn in our imaginations forever. Four dead in Ohio. May 4th, 1970, National Guard troops at, at Ohio, at Kent State, uh, four innocent kids protesting are, are dead. Neil goes out into the woods and writes that, that amazing lyric of four dead in Ohio. He writes this in about two hours. Here's the dead at, at the concert at Kresge Plaza, MIT. And then we come to Fairfield University in 1970. Very different from the quiet, very orderly, very calm uh, campus of today. But the, this place was churning, turbulence of all male campus. A lot of these guys were with, with uh, draft numbers that were very low, and they weren't going to go. Students gathering to protest in what was called the People's Meeting. Um, here's the the give and take, protest and anti-strikers uh, in front of Canisius Hall. Uh, note the guys that Carrie Weaver told me, note the letter jackets on the guys who are supporting the war. You know, so we support you know, the, the athletes and whatever. Then this whole generation of fearful boys with long hair, peace signs. I mean, this is, this is almost a cartoon. It's not far as come. It is life as it, was, as it happened. The students at Fairfield, take over the administration uh, at Canisius Hall, uh, locking the administration out. This is Father McGinnis on the left with the bullhorn. <laughs> Father James Coughlin, the Jesuit priest who hired me when I was 24 years old to teach at Fairfield University, was being locked out of his building. Mc President McGinnis is now negotiating with campus students and many faculty members, incidentally, were critical in this, and this created the origins of tripartite government and governance here at Fairfield University. Fairfield University on strike. Well, May 9th, May 9th, just five days after four dead in Ohio, Ohio, we were supposed to have the doors here with John V. Sebastian. These are the tickets. Uh, those of us on campus know Jim Fitzpatrick donated these to the University Archives. These were his tickets that were never used. Uh, and the concert was canceled 
when the town fathers down in town and in collaboration with the university administrators said that Mr. James Morrison is not a fit role model for Fairfield men. The Lizard King, not a fit role model. I don't know, I mean, I missed that in Philosophy 110, I missed that. Thanks to Elise Buschinski from uh, University Archivist, from the Domena Library, from Domena Vasilius, who helped pull this together for me. And now the main uh, event, Nicholas G. Merriweather, founding archivist of the Grateful Dead Archive, University of California, Santa Cruz. If my words did blow, discoursing the Grateful Dead, Nicholas Merriweather, who you're about to meet, has single-handedly, spearheaded, has single-handedly created an entire field of the American landscape of the American Academy. This is his life work. He began this, bumped into this accidentally, and he is the, you know, the, the leader of it. He, he pulls this together. He is in, in uh, conversations with the key people, whether it's in the music, the band, the people. They trusted him to become the archivist at the University of California. And in 2008, the he's going to tell you about the, the archive at Santa Cruz, a great, great place. Fortunately, I got out there. It's pretty far down into Santa Cruz. Fortunately, I was at my, my nephew's wedding, and I got, I, we got there. But you're all invited. If you're deadheads, and you don't have to give a scholarly paper. The Grateful Dead Caucus meets every year in uh, Albuquerque and in Taos. And this is a community of like-minded kindred spirits, and this is a very exciting community. I was invited to speak at Nick's lecture um, at, at his conference in San Jose, the big mega conference. And being an art historian, I gave a talk on the, the art history, the icons and images and tropes of the dead. And this is a gold mine. I mean, I have maybe another 40 or 50 years of work to do on this because we, I mean, we're out of this gold mine of images and connecting the history, these icons to the history of art. So let's welcome for our keynote speaker, the founding archivist of the Grateful Dead, curating and documenting the Heart of Gold band, Mr. Nicholas Merriweather. Nick. The only thing I would quickly add to that is it's really nice of Philip to give me credit for uh, starting the discourse of dead studies, but truth be told, I am one of many people, and I'm in some ways a Johnny come lately. Uh, as you'll see as we get into my lecture, there were many folks who recognized the academic possibilities of the Grateful Dead long before, uh, actually before I was even born, really. So uh, but thank you, Philip, for a very kind introduction. And thank you all for coming, and thank Fairfield very much for, uh, for hosting me and for making it possible. Archivists don't get out much, so uh, <laughs> it's true. We do our thing. When we perform at our best, no one ever sees us. It's behind the scenes, and we're, uh, we're in front of a bunch of boxes and file folders, and that's what actually makes us happiest. So it's nice to be able to get out and explain a little bit about, about what I'm doing to all of you. Um, the title of my talk is Archiving the Counterculture and Raising the Dead, the Grateful Dead Archive and the Legacy of the Sixties, which not only acknowledges the multifaceted nature of the Grateful Dead phenomenon, but also the multifarious ways that the archive can help us understand the context that they invoke, the sixties and the counterculture. That connection is something that historians have complained about for decades, which is a primary difficulty in studying the sixties. That era is particularly challenging because of the central role that the counterculture occupies in any discussion of that turbulent decade. 